Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we looked at degrees of freedom, and how the number of degrees of freedom is connected to the different forms of energy – electronic, vibrational, rotational, and translational. Each of these contributes to the overall energy. So, overall, the energy of a molecule is a combination of contributions from the electronic energy, the vibrational energy, the rotational energy, and the translational energy. One thing we'll want to get a clear picture of is how these different energies are related to each other. To start with, let's think about the lowest energy state of our molecule. As you might remember, the electronic energy is lowest when the electron is in the n equals 1 state. That's called the ground state, and as you might guess, the molecule can also be in the lowest vibrational and rotational energy levels too, which are called the ground state vibrational or rotational energy levels. Just like the electronic energy level has the symbol n, the vibrational energy level has the symbol v, and the rotational level has the symbol j. The ground states of these forms of energy happen when n equals 1, v equals 0, and j equals 0. As you know from previous classes, electrons can be excited to higher energy levels, and these have numbers n equals 2, 3, 4, and so on. The energy of each level is higher than the one before, but the energy increase is a little less every time we increase n, so the energies get closer and closer together as we go to higher energy levels. But what about other forms of energy? It turns out that each of the electronic energy levels has a set of vibrational energy levels associated with it. For example, if our molecule is in the ground state electronic level, we can add a little energy and excite the vibration into a higher state. We're not adding enough energy to send the electron into the n equals 2 level, it's a much lower energy than that and that allows us to get an excited vibrational energy without leaving the ground state electronic energy. Just like the electronic energy levels, the vibrational levels get closer and closer together as we raise the energy. Each electronic energy level has its own set of vibrational levels, so if we look at both types of energy levels, the diagram starts to look fairly complicated. And we haven't even talked about the rotational levels yet. Each of the vibrational levels has its own set of rotational energy levels. Just like the electronic and vibrational levels, these get closer together as we raise the energy. So when we combine the electronic, vibrational, and rotational levels, this diagram looks very messy. But let's look at what this diagram is actually telling us. The electronic energy levels are spaced apart by a fairly large energy. And for that reason, it takes a photon with a lot of energy to raise an electron from one electronic level to another. This often requires photons with a visible or ultraviolet wavelength. For that reason, we use a UV-Vis spectrometer to detect transitions between the electronic energy levels of a molecule. Meanwhile, the vibrational energy levels are spaced more closely together, so it doesn't take as much energy to cause transitions between the vibrational levels. If you check the electromagnetic spectrum, you can see that photons in the infrared region have lower energy than visible photons. That's why infrared spectrometers are used to detect vibrations in molecules. As you might guess, we use photons with even lower energies to detect transitions between the rotational energy levels. The photons we use are in the microwave region. So, rotations, vibrations, and electronic transitions are each detected using a different wavelength region. You might have noticed that we didn't mention the translational energy levels. That's because they're extremely close together in energy. So close that they seem as though there is no separation between them. We don't usually talk about translational energy levels, because translational energy can have almost any value. Notice that the electronic energy levels don't involve motion of any kind. The electronic energy is purely potential energy. On the other hand, the translational, rotational, and vibrational energy levels all do involve forms of motion. 
and those forms of motion are called degrees of freedom. To understand degrees of freedom, it's easiest to start by thinking about the energy that arises from each of the three types of molecular motion, translations, rotations, and vibrations. Let's look at translational energy first. It turns out that the average translational energy in one dimension is one-half times kb times t. kb here is a constant called the Boltzmann constant, and it's just equal to r, the gas law constant, divided by Avogadro's number. kb is a number that comes up in a number of different equations in chemistry and physics, so it's worth remembering. Meanwhile, rotations have a similar energy. It turns out that rotation around an axis has a value of one-half kb times t, just like the translational energy in one dimension. What about vibrational energy? Each vibration contributes twice as much energy to the molecule as a rotation does, so each vibration contributes kb times t. So, now we know how much energy each translation, rotation, and vibration contributes to the molecule. To get the total energy a molecule has due to various types of motion, we multiply each energy contribution by the number of translations, rotations, or vibrations the molecule can experience. Those numbers are what we mean by the degrees of freedom. So, how many translational degrees of freedom are there? It turns out that every molecule can move in the x, y, or z direction, so there are three translational degrees of freedom. What about rotational degrees of freedom? It might seem like every molecule would have three rotational degrees of freedom because a molecule can rotate around the x, y, or z axes. Most molecules do indeed have three rotational degrees of freedom, but that's actually not true for all molecules. For example, consider an acetylene molecule. Suppose we define the axes so that the z-axis is oriented along the bond. Now imagine what rotation around each of the axes would look like. Rotation around the x-axis makes the molecule twirl like a propeller and rotation around the y-axis does the same. However, rotation around the z-axis doesn't have any detectable effect on the molecule. Since the molecule is symmetric around the z-axis, rotating around that axis has no effect on the molecule or its energy. So, for a linear molecule, there are just two rotational degrees of freedom, not three. That means that for a nonlinear molecule, there are three translational degrees of freedom and also three rotational degrees. For linear molecules, there are three translational degrees of freedom, but only two rotational. Now imagine what happens if we just have one atom, like a helium atom. Single atoms are nearly spherical. So for a helium atom, rotating around the x, y, or z axis has no effect on the atom. That means there are no rotational degrees of freedom for a single atom. However, there are still three translational degrees of freedom, because the atom can noticeably move in any of the three dimensions. What about vibrational degrees of freedom? Well, there are no vibrational degrees of freedom for a single atom because there aren't any bonds that could vibrate. For linear molecules, it turns out that there are 3n minus 5 possible vibrations, and for nonlinear molecules, there are 3n minus 6 vibrations, where n is the number of atoms in the molecule. So, for example, carbonyl sulfide is a linear molecule made of three atoms. Therefore, it can undergo 3n minus 5 vibrations, for a total of 4 altogether. On the other hand, the molecule methylamine is a nonlinear molecule made of 7 atoms. Since it's nonlinear, it can undergo 3n minus 6 vibrations, for a total of 15. So, here's a summary of the number of degrees of freedom for translations, rotations, and vibrations for different kinds of atoms and molecules. 
If we combine this with the energy for each type of motion, we get this equation for the overall energy of the molecule due to different forms of motion. We can simplify the equation a bit by factoring out 1 half kb times t, which gives us this equation. Notice that we've been using the Greek letter epsilon for the energy instead of the letter e. This is because we're calculating the energy for just one molecule. Of course, ordinarily we want the energy of a much larger sample, something that we could see with our eyes. To get that, we'll just multiply this equation by the number of molecules, which we'll call capital N. We can simplify this equation a bit. Recall that Kb, the Boltzmann constant, is equal to R divided by Avogadro's number. But n divided by Avogadro's number is just equal to the number of moles, which is little n. So that gives us this for our equation for the energy of a sample of molecules based on the degrees of freedom in the molecules. It's most accurate for samples that behave like ideal gases. This equation is a very easy way to determine the energy due to the motions of molecules in a sample, and it's known as the equipartition principle. One of the most useful things we can do with it is determine the energy that would be needed to heat a sample. Let's try it. Suppose we have three samples of gas, a mole of helium, a mole of acetylene, and a mole of water. We heat each sample from 400 Kelvin to 500 Kelvin. How much energy would be needed to heat each of the three samples? To answer this question, we'll use the equipartition principle to calculate the energy of each sample at 400 Kelvin and at 500 Kelvin. Let's start with the sample of helium. We have one mole, R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, and the temperature is 400 Kelvin at the start. Because this is a single atom, there are three translational degrees of freedom zero rotational degrees of freedom, and zero vibrational degrees of freedom. That gives us 4988.4 joules. When we do this calculation over again using the final temperature of 500 Kelvin, we get 6235.5 joules. So that's a difference of 1247.1 joules. So that's the energy that would be needed to heat the mole of helium from 400 to 500 Kelvin. Now let's try it again for acetylene. Once again, we have one mole, R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, and the temperature is 400 Kelvin at the start and 500 Kelvin at the end. Acetylene is a linear molecule made up of four atoms, so there are three translational degrees of freedom, two rotational degrees of freedom, and seven vibrational degrees of freedom. That gives us 31,593.2 joules at 400 Kelvin, and 39,491.5 joules at 500 Kelvin. That's a difference of 7,898.3 joules for acetylene. Finally, let's try it for water. The number of moles and the temperature are still the same. Water is a nonlinear molecule with three atoms, so there are three translational degrees of freedom, three rotational degrees of freedom, and three vibrational degrees of freedom. That gives us 19,953.6 joules at 400 Kelvin, and 24,942 joules at 500 Kelvin. That's a difference of 4,988.4 joules for water. So, now we know how to calculate different forms of energy. But how likely is it that a given particle will have that energy? Back in video 41, we saw that one way of calculating the probability that a molecule is in a given energy state is using this equation. As you might recall, the denominator in this equation is called the partition function and is given by this expression. Notice that the exponent includes the energy for the particular energy state we're looking at. 
However, we can express that energy differently depending on whether it's vibrational, rotational, or translational energy. Let's look at each of those possibilities and see how the expression for the partition function is different in each of those cases. First, let's look at the vibrational partition function. As we've seen in earlier videos, the energy of a vibration can be written this way, where V is the number of the vibrational level, and omega is the vibrational constant, which is unique for a particular vibration and has units of energy. Notice that as V increases, each term in this summation becomes smaller and smaller exponentially. As it turns out, that summation is an infinite series that can be written in a closed form. When we do so, we find that the partition function can be written like this. Notice that this partition function only contains one vibrational constant. In other words, it only allows for one vibration in a molecule. Of course, we know that only diatomic molecules actually have just one vibration. Molecules with more than two atoms will have multiple vibrations. For those molecules, the vibrational partition function will actually be a product of partition functions, one for each possible vibration. We can do some useful things with this partition function. As you might recall, the probability that a system has a particular energy is given by this equation. We can rewrite that expression this way for vibrational energy. Now, suppose we take an infrared spectrum of a sample of iodine, I2. What's the probability that a given molecule will have each of the three lowest vibrational states of iodine at 300 Kelvin, where the vibrational constant for iodine is 214 reciprocal centimeters? We know that Boltzmann's constant involves joules, so to make the units in this equation work out, we should start by changing the vibrational constant from reciprocal centimeters to joules. First, we'll convert to reciprocal meters, which gives us 21,400 reciprocal meters. If we now take the reciprocal, we get 4.673 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. We can now use this equation to find that the frequency is 6.4157 times 10 to the 12 per second. We can then use this equation to find that the energy is 4.2575 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. Now let's plug that into the equation for the partition function. That gives us a result of 1.557. Now we can use that to calculate the probability of, for the three energy states the question describes. For the first energy state, V is 0, so we have this expression. That gives us a probability of 0 0.6423. For the second energy state, V equals 1, and that gives us this expression. The probability here is equal to 0 0.2269. And finally, for the third energy state, V equals 2, which gives us this expression. This time, the probability is 0 0.08116. So that shows us how we can use the partition function to figure out the probability of different vibrational states. Next, let's look at the partition function for rotational energy states. The rotational partition function depends on the geometry of the molecule. It's different depending on whether the molecule is linear, planar, or another shape. That means the partition function can be significantly different for different molecules. However, a good general expression is this one, where A, B, and C are the rotational constants for rotations around each of the x, y, and z axes. For translational motion, the partition function is this, where v is the volume of the space in which the molecules can move. Let's try using this one. What's the partition function for a sample of oxygen gas at 300 Kelvin in an imaginary spherical container with a radius of 10 angstroms? 
To solve this problem, we once again need to convert the units to SI units so that they'll cancel out during the calculation. Let's start with the mass. As we can see from the periodic table, O2 molecules weigh 31.9994 AMUs. If we convert that to kilograms, we get 5.314 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Meanwhile, we'll use the formula for the volume of a sphere to get the volume. The radius is 10 angstroms, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. That gives us a volume of 4.189 times 10 to the minus 27 meters cubed. When we plug these values into the expression for the partition function, we find that it's equal to 740,532. Notice that this is much larger than the partition function we had for vibrational motion. The reason for that is that as you might recall, there are many, many translational energy levels for each rotational and vibrational energy level. That means the translational energy will be distributed over many more energy levels, so the partition function will be correspondingly large. Let's try one more example. What's the partition function for a sample of oxygen gas at 300 Kelvin in a 100 milliliter flask? This is the same problem as the last one, but the volume is much larger. That means the mass is the same as in the last example, 5.314 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Meanwhile, the volume is 100 milliliters, which is the same as 1 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. When we plug these values into the expression for the partition function, we find that it's 1.768 times 10 to the 28th power. Notice that this is far larger than the partition function we had in the last problem. That's because the volume of the system is much larger, so many more translational energy states are available for the molecules. Well, that's enough new material for now. And that's the last of the videos for this course. That probably means you'll have an exam soon. I hope you do well on it. Good luck! And I hope you've learned some interesting things in this course. I hope you'll take more chemistry courses, and I hope to see you in class again soon.